remind the governor of Ohio about this and, you know, whether you supported the rescue plan or not, um, it's important these dollars get out the door so people aren't evicted. So I ask you to, um, to do whatever you can in your states. The money went to state governments and to more large county, large cities within your state. Uh, today, we'll quickly consider the nomination of Damon Smith to serve as general counsel of HUD. He understands the challenges millions of Americans face. He knows a stable home makes the difference between life and death, not just during a pandemic. He currently serves as senior advisor at HUD. He previously served as senior counsel, acting general counsel at HUD during the Obama-Biden administration. He's a law professor at Rutgers and American U, a graduate of Harvard Law School, holds a bachelor's degree in English at the University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. He's eminently qualified. I strongly support his nomination and urge others to do the same. Senator Toomey. Uh, I intend to support the nominee, as I think um, a majority of Republicans are, and I think we're ready to proceed to the vote. I, I appreciate that. We'll proceed. I, I'll move to report favorably the nomination. Those in favor say aye. Aye. All the opposed say nay. The ayes have it. The nomination's approved. In order, reported favorably to the Senate. Uh, we will now begin the hearing. Uh, Thank you all for your cooperation and showing up on time. Uh, we'll hear testimony. Uh, the hearing itself now will come to order. We'll hear testimony from the heads of three agencies responsible for protecting our financial system, make sure it serves everyone, uh, the National Credit Union Administration, NCUA, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC, and the Office of the Controller of the Currency, the OCC. Because of the work we've done with the rescue plan, putting, America, putting money in people's pockets and making progress against the pandemic, our economy is starting to recover, adding more jobs every month. For the first time, workers are starting to reclaim a little bit of power in our economy. As we build on this progress, we need to make sure those gains end up in the, in the, in the pockets of working families, the people who made this progress possible. We need to make sure their money is protected. Together, those of you before us today embody the public backing of our banking system. Yet most people, frankly, don't know your agencies even exist, let alone what you do. They see the letters NCUA and FDIC and the signs outside credit unions and banks are emblazoned on the backs of credit cards. They don't think about much what they mean. They shouldn't have to. People are busy working hard to support their families and raise their kids. They're supposed to be able to trust you, their watchdogs, to keep their money safe. When I talk to Ohioans, though I hear the same message, people don't trust the banks, especially the largest banks. They remember after the Great Recession, when we called it a recovery around here, workers didn't get much of a raise and entire neighborhoods and towns were left behind. They've been burned by exorbitant fees, high minimum balances, segregated second chance accounts. They watch bigger banks buy up the smaller ones and close local branches, making it harder and harder for small businesses and working families to get, a, get an affordable small business loan or a mortgage. It's happening in my home state. It's happening across the country in rural communities and black and brown communities and all the communities that Wall Street is trampled on. We know what happens when people don't have a credit union or a bank they trust in their community, they turn to expensive check cashers and shady payday lenders that prey too often on working families. Last week, before our hearing on extending the military's 36% interest rate capped everyone, I talked to a mother from Lorraine, Ohio, who had to take out a payday lend loan to pay her bill. She ended up trapped in a cycle of debt. We know that story is all too common. Or people turn to so-called fintechs that claim to make banking easier and cheaper, but have few protections and put people's money at risk. I urge the CFPB to look into the risks of these kinds of fintechs like Chime after customers were locked out of their accounts and couldn't get access to their own money, putting their ability to buy groceries, pay their bills, make their rent at risk. These issues people may not... People may not have seemed connected, but they all stem from the same big problem. Big banks and corporations have too much unchecked power on our, over our commun community and over our economy. We need no-fee accounts that allow everyone to open a bank account and have control over their money. We need to close the loopholes that allow so-called fintech firms to play by a different set of rules than banks and credit unions, leading to unfair competition, putting consumers' money at risk. We need strong financial watchdogs that hold financial institutions accountable and ensure these institutions serve their communities and their customers instead of lining their own pockets. For too long, we've had regulators who didn't think standing up to Wall Street was part of their job. 
They rolled back the rules that in industry had spent years begging for. They rewarded themselves and instead, instead of investing in the people whom they were supposed to serve. There are a lot of community-based institutions in my state and in all of your states, like CDFIs and MDIs and small credit unions and community banks. They're the ones making the small business loans. They're the ones working with borrowers when they might miss a mortgage payment because of a sudden uh, medical expense or a lost job. They stepped up to help neighbors during the pandemic. It's your job as the regulators to make sure that all financial institutions from Wall Street to Main Street do the same. Regulators like the FDIC must change their approach to bank mergers. No more rubber stamping every merger leaving towns in Ohio and across the country with no branches. When mergers do happen, you need to make sure that banks live up to the promises that they made to the community. We should be cracking down on risky shadow banks that use the allure of shiny new financial technology to distract us from the facts that they are just payday lenders with a fancy app. We need stronger capital requirements so that banks and credit unions can continue to lend to and invest in their communities in good times and bad times. We now have new leadership at NCUA with Chair Harper, who's working on a bipartisan basis to strengthen the NCUA and ensure that credit unions serve their members and communities. I applaud Acting Controller Sue for rescinding the misguided changes to the CRA that former Controller Odding rushed through. The legacy of black codes and Jim Crow and redlining still holds back too many communities, and the OCC's rule did not serve CRA's core purpose, to ensure that banks serve low-income communities and communities of color. I'm glad that all three bank regulators, the Fed, the OCC, and the FDIC, are listening to feedback and developing a proposal that will make sure banks serve everyone. Thankfully, President Biden is replacing Trump-era regulators with leaders who understand that their job is to stand up for working Americans, not for Wall Street. We need diverse regulators who know firsthand our financial system hasn't delivered for large portions of the country. The people who oversee our country's economy need to reflect the Americans who make it work, black and brown communities, low-income communities, off other underrepresented communities, and working families from the rural south to the industrial Midwest, not just the wealthiest Washington insiders. Financial regulators do your jobs. Working Americans should be able to trust that government looks out for them. They won't have to worry they'll fall victim to a debt trap or have their bank accounts zeroed out because of unfair overdraft fees. You're all public servants. You're responsible for making sure that this economy and the financial system work for the American people. Look forward for, to hearing from you today, Senator Jimmy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, today we'll hear from the OCC, the FDIC, and the NCUA about their recent regulatory actions. So I want to welcome all the witnesses with a special welcome to Chairman McWilliams, for whom this is a homecoming of sorts, given her a distinguished career as a senior staffer on this committee. Throughout the pandemic, I've been encouraged by certain modest targeted regulatory changes to support the financial system. However, as the pandemic recedes, I'm now concerned that the Biden administration is seeking to use financial regulation to advance social goals that are unrelated to banking. And its agency heads are contributing to the politicization of banking regulation without providing independent analysis. Such a shift would erode the longstanding nonpartisan objective of having independent regulatory agencies. As one example, the administration's executive order, or EO, on climate risks seeks to use financial regulation to further environmental policy objectives. Under the guise of, quote, assessing risk, unquote, the EO directs the regulatory agencies to undertake a range of actions, including the consideration of new or revised regulatory standards. But if the actual purpose was to assess risk, wouldn't it logically follow that actual analysis occur before jumping ahead to a policy response? This is the crucial point. The EO doesn't seek a neutral inquiry. Instead, it presupposes the conclusion that there is, in fact, specific climate-related financial stability risk that's not being properly accounted for by either institutions or regulators, and it pressures supposedly independent agencies to enact backdoor environmental policy without appropriate accountability and while these agencies lack any expertise in environmental matters. I'm concerned that some agency heads are willingly participating in this politicized effort. For example, last week, Acting Comptroller Sue announced the OCC would join the Network for Greening the Financial System, or the NGFS, an international organization whose stated aim is to, and I quote, 
mobilize mainstream finance to support the transition toward a sustainable economy, end quote. In other words, to have government allocate credit, which is antithetical to a free enterprise system. At a recent FSOC meeting, NCUA Chairman Harper helpfully ceded the point by asserting that credit unions, and I quote, will need to consider adjusting their fields of membership or altering lending portfolios, end quote, as a result of climate risk. But most credit unions are small institutions that serve their local communities. The suggestion that their fields of membership need to change because of climate change doesn't result from any actual risk assessment. It's simply based on politics. I'm also deeply troubled by the administration's apparent unwillingness to nominate an individual, perhaps at any point, to serve as comptroller on a full-time basis. By installing Mr. Su as acting controller with no nominee in sight, the administration appears to have every intention of indefinitely bypassing the constitutionally required Senate confirmation. Now, four years ago, some Democrats expressed outrage that an acting comptroller was appointed. They wrote that, and I quote, the comptroller must be nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate, end quote. Now, in that instance, the acting comptroller had only served for a grand total of one month before a permanent nominee was, in fact, sent to the Senate. In contrast, Mr. Sue has served as acting comptroller for nearly three months, and we've not heard anything about any permanent nominee. Yet I've heard no complaints from my Democratic colleagues about this fact. Rather than pursue social goals unrelated to banking, regulators should be looking for ways to increase competition and improve regulatory efficiency. Last month, the administration issued an EO that's purportedly intended to increase competition. But upon closer look, the EO would only make it more difficult for small and medium-sized banks to merge, when doing so actually presents opportunities to compete more effectively against very large banks. The EO would therefore actually decrease competition within the banking system. If the administration were serious about promoting competition, it would seek to reduce the regulatory burdens imposed by Dodd-Frank, which have contributed to an unbelievable decline in de novo banking activity over the past decade. According to the FDIC, between 1985 and 2011, the first full year under the Dodd-Frank Act, 183 new institutions were chartered every year on average, 183. In the period from 2012 to 2019, prior to the pandemic, we averaged four new charters per year. Now, I'm encouraged by the FDIC's work in this space under Chairman McWilliams, including revisions to the agency's process for reviewing deposit insurance proposals. These changes, I believe, have contributed to an uptick in de novo banks before the onset of the pandemic, but I think more can be done. And I'm concerned that rather than facilitating de novo activity and encouraging innovation, Acting Comptroller Sue has suggested that he'll reconsider the OCC's recent approvals for national trust banks that provide digital asset custody services. Now, these approvals were granted after extensive engagement and analysis and they bring digital assets into the regulated financial system. The reality is the banking system is changing. Banking is changing, and new products and services offered by innovative companies offer tremendous potential benefits for consumers. Regulators should want these innovative financial institutions to enter regulated financial system, and that would make it easier for them, which would make it easier for them to become banks, for instance, add consumer protections, increase safety and soundness, reduce risk. So, I hope to hear from today's witnesses about how they will maintain independence in the face of pressure to politicize banking regulation, and I look forward to discussing steps their agencies are taking to increase competition, promote innovation, and improve regulatory efficiency, which will ultimately result in a stronger banking and financial system for all Americans. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Toomey. I'll introduce today's witnesses. We'll hear from NCUA Chair Todd Harper. FDIC Chair Yellen McWilliams and Acting Controller of the Currency, Michael Sue. The leaders of these agencies are central to making sure our banking and financial system work for everyone, for consumers, small businesses, and their communities. Chair Harper, please proceed for five minutes. Thank you for joining us. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting me to discuss the credit union industry's performance and the NCUA's operations. Despite the COVID-19 pandemic's many economic blows, the credit union system has remained on a solid footing with strong capital levels and liquidity. As of the first quarter of 2021, the NCUA's um, uh, credit union system had almost $2 trillion in assets and nearly 126 million members. If past recessions are indicative, 
it seems likely that credit union performance will trail any labor market improvements by up to two years. The NCUA and credit unions should, therefore, prepare for that eventuality. Once pandemic relief efforts end, we will likely experience decreases in credit quality and increases in delinquencies and charge-offs, which would affect credit union financial statements and could, if failures occur, impact the share insurance fund. Unfortunately, the pandemic has disproportionately affected low-income households, communities of color, and minority-owned businesses. The NCUA has encouraged credit unions to work with members experiencing hardship, and we, like the other, ex uh, my fellow regulators here at this table, have instructed examiners to refrain from criticizing a credit union's efforts to provide prudent relief for members. Through the Community Development Revolving Loan Fund, the NCUA is supporting low-income credit unions during these uncertain times. Although relatively small, these grants and loans make a big difference. Last year, the NCUA awarded $3.7 million to 162 credit unions to assist in their pandemic response efforts. Although many more applied for the grant, the agency could not fund the demand because of limited appropriations. As such, I request that Congress consider increasing the fund's appropriations to $10 million. The pandemic has also prompted a heightened cybersecurity stance at our agency. In 2021, the NCUA will continue to provide guidance and resources to assist credit unions with strengthening their cyber defenses, including funding grants and continuing a pilot project to harmonize information technology and cybersecurity exam procedures. The NCUA is further working to strengthen its consumer financial program and to ensure fair and equitable access to credit. This year, there is an increased emphasis on fair lending compliance and agency staff are studying methods for improving consumer financial protection supervision for the largest credit unions not primarily supervised by the CFPB. Additionally, since opening our Office of Minority and Women Inclusion one decade ago, we have made steady, steady progress in advancing diversity. Two out of every five new hires in 2020 at the NCUA were people of color, and the agency achieved parity in executive gender diversity. The NCUA will continue to invest in diversity and inclusion by enhancing support for minority depository institutions and fostering initiatives to close the wealth gap. These efforts will advance economic equity and justice within the system and ensure a more equitable recovery. Finally, I would like to highlight three areas where legislative action would aid the agency in fulfilling its mission. First, FSOC, GAO, the NCUA's Inspector General, and every NCUA chairman over the last decade have called for the agency to have examination and enforcement authority over third-party vendors. The continued transfer of operations to credit union service organizations and other third parties diminishes the NCUA's ability to assess risk within the system. To protect thousands of credit unions, millions of credit union members, and billions of dollars in assets potentially exposed to unnecessary risk, Congress should close this growing regulatory blind spot. Second, Congress should provide the NCUA with greater authority to proactively manage the share insurance fund. Adopting a counter-cyclical approach to charging premiums would allow for an increase in insurance reserves during economic upturns to cover losses during downturns. And third, Congress should permanently adopt the temporary enhancements granted in the NCUA's central liquidity facility as part of the CARES Act. The CLF's borrowing capacity has quadrupled with these reforms, and four out of five credit unions now have access to liquidity if other sources freeze up. Permanence would strengthen the shock absorbers for future liquidity events. In conclusion, in navigating the pandemic's economic fallout, the NCUA remains focused on addressing the needs and best interests of credit union members. We are also ensuring the safety and soundness of credit unions and protecting the share insurance fund. I look forward to working with the committee in support of these endeavors. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Harper. Uh, Chair McWilliams, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Senator. Is this on? Okay, yeah, it's on. It's working. All right. Thank you. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the FDIC's supervisory, regulatory, and consumer protection efforts. Senator Toomey, I want to thank you personally for keeping the emphasis on the Nova Banks. In fact, between 
2011 and until I assumed my chairmanship in June of 2018, we had eight true de novo approved. Um, and we have had 43 since I assumed chairmanship and we have 16 applications in the process. So thank you for emphasizing that. As my written testimony describes in more detail, we have made tremendous strides in these areas under my chairmanship and especially during an unprecedented shock caused by the COVID-19 pandemic and the ensuing economic stress. We have worked hard to promote and preserve the nation's minority depository institutions, provide flexibility to banks to assist their communities during historic economic stress, and encourage responsible use of technology and innovation to reach the last mile of unbanked Americans while maintaining our supervisory activities, regulatory process, and resolution preparedness. As the pandemic began to unfold in the United States, supervised institutions took steps to help consumers well before government support arrived by allowing long loan modifications with no fees, waiving fees on accounts, offering curbside services, providing digital options to customers, and instituting branch sanitation and employee health check procedures. Banks of all sizes originated the overwhelming majority of approximately $800 billion in PPP loans. While we continue to be encouraged by the state of the banking sector as we enter our new normal, uncertainty remains, and we're carefully monitoring conditions from commercial real estate to agriculture to consumer lending to cybersecurity. Although we have focused heavily on ensuring that consumers have access to credit during the pandemic and that banks continue to operate in a safe and sound manner, we have continued our ongoing supervision, examination, and regulatory activities along the way. Last December, the FDIC updated our broker deposit regulations to address the evolution of how banks offer services and products since the original rule was prom were promulgated 30 years, 30 years ago. We codified legally enforceable commitments of ILCs and their parent companies to ensure that the parent company serves as a source of financial strength for the ILC while providing clarity about our supervisory expectations of both the ILC and the parent. In January, we finalized guidelines establishing a new Office of Supervisory Appeals to help promote consistency among examiners and ensure accountability at the FDIC. And last month, we issued a proposal to simplify the deposit insurance rules for trust accounts and rationalize such rules for mortgage servicing accounts. The pandemic has only amplified how critical innovation is in our everyday activities. Our focus on innovation is aimed at ensuring that American banks remain competitive in a rapidly changing world, that American consumers have access to a broad array of financial products and services, that we can bring unbanked Americans into the financial fabric of this country and do so in a way that will provide a path to economic and social inclusion. My focus on economic inclusion is informed in no small part by my personal experience. Last Thursday marked my 30th anniversary in the United States. For years, putting food on my table and having a roof over my head required working three to four minimum wage jobs. And so the uneven impact of the pandemic and its recovery on different populations throughout the United States has been especially worrisome and frankly personal. I can assure you that the FDIC is using its authorities to support a safer, fairer, and more inclusive banking system, including novel approaches such as the creation of the mission-driven bank fund that will channel private sector investments to support MDIs and CDFIs, a tech sprint to explore new technologies and techniques that can expand community banks' capabilities to meet the needs of unbanked households, a targeted public awareness campaign to inform consumers about the benefits of being banked, and a new diversity strategic plan with actionable steps that will help measure our progress over the next few years and support economic inclusion in our communities. As the FDIC makes progress on these issues, the dedicated public servants of the FDIC will continue to fulfill the agency's critical mission of maintaining stability and public confidence in the nation's financial system. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chair McWilliams. Welcome back. Go ahead. Acting Controller Tzu, welcome. Chairman Brown, Ranking Member Toomey, members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm honored by Secretary Yellen's confidence to appoint me to this post of Acting Comptroller of the Currency. I'm a career public servant and a bank supervisor at my core. My 19 years of experience at multiple agencies have spanned periods of growth, crisis, reform, and recovery. My written testimony shares in more detail my priorities. 
I see four urgent problems requiring immediate attention. Guarding against complacency, reducing inequality, adapting to digitalization, and acting on climate change. Let me briefly describe each. First, I believe the banking system is at risk of becoming complacent. Banks deserve credit for weathering the pandemic well thus far. I am concerned, however, that as the economy recovers and pressure to grow returns, overconfidence leading to complacency is a risk when prudent risk management is set aside in pursuit of profit. I see the losses related to Archegos, the froth in SPACs and crypto, and the recent buzz around buy now, pay later as potential warning flags. Today, bank leaders, boards of directors, and we supervisors must be especially vigilant. Second, reducing inequality must be a national priority as reflected by the theme of this hearing. The pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on vulnerable groups and the recovery threatens to leave them even further behind. Historically, many low-income individuals have been treated by banks as either credits to be avoided or credits to be exploited. I'm committed to changing this, starting with strengthening the Community Reinvestment Act, or CRA. Last month, I announced that the OCC would propose rescinding the agency's 2020 rule and commit to working with the Federal Reserve and FDIC to put forward a joint rulemaking that strengthens and modernizes the CRA. In doing so, we will make sure to seek public comment on any changes so that all voices are heard and considered. In addition, I recently encouraged participants in the OCC's Project REACH to aim higher in addressing barriers to financial inclusion, such as using alternative data to help bring those without credit scores into the financial mainstream. Preventing predatory lending is just as important as increasing financial inclusion. Following Congress's repeal of the True Lender Rule, I instructed staff to gather and analyze data uh, on bank fintech partnerships in order to explore how we can identify and differentiate between harmful rent-to-charter arrangements and healthy partnerships that expand access to credit. That analysis will inform the development of future options to protect consumers and expand financial inclusion. Third, we financial regulators must collectively adapt to the digitalization of banking and finance and determine how fintechs, payment platforms, and digital assets fit into the regulated system. When I took office, I paused approvals of novel charters, pending an internal review of the OCC's licensing framework and of recent interpretive letters. In June, the OCC, FDIC, and Federal Reserve established a sprint team to provide greater clarity and collaboration around digital assets and cryptocurrencies. In July, we were excited to join the President's Working Group in evaluating the risks of stablecoins and developing policy recommendations. These efforts seek to adapt to a rapidly changing landscape in a coordinated manner across agencies to facilitate responsible innovation while limiting regulatory arbitrage and races to the bottom. Fourth, we must recognize that climate change is a safety and soundness issue, and we must act accordingly. Banks, especially large banks, are exposed to both physical and transition risks from climate change. Identifying, measuring, and managing these risks is challenging. The OCC is taking a two-pronged approach. The OCC recently joined the Network for Greening the Financial System, NGFS, a group of central banks and supervisors from across the globe who share best practices. Second, we must support the development and adoption of effective climate change risk management practices at banks. I have asked staff to review and evaluate the current range of practices with an eye towards identifying best practices and laggards. The OCC recently appointed the Climate Change Risk Officer to lead this effort and to expand the agency's capacity to collaborate with stakeholders. Finally, my testimony reiterates the OCC's commitment to fostering well-managed community banks and allowing them to grow and thrive. We are mindful of the importance of tailoring our regulatory requirements and mitigating the burden our examination process can have on smaller institutions. We are leveraging technology and blending our on-site and off-site work and studying ways to further reduce fees charged to community banks in order to level the playing field with state chartered and unregulated competitors. Thank you again for this opportunity to testify, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Sue. Uh, Chair Harper, uh, recently Senator Reid and I introduced the Veterans and Consumers Fair Credit Act with Senator Van Hollen, who's here today, Senator Smith and Senator Warnock. Our bill would extend the Military Lending Act's 36% APR cap on consumer loans to those left out of the original legislation, veterans, essentially other cons all other consumers. What impact would this legislation have on loan products offered by federally chartered credit unions? 
generally, uh, Senator, currently there is a cap on interest rates with uh, federal credit unions. It's 18% for most loans except for our payday alternative loan product, which is a short-term loan, pro- um, short uh, low-dollar loan product, and that goes up to 28%. Both of those figures are below the 36%, so my answer is not at all. Okay. Thank you, Chair Harper. Uh, the FDIC has the authority to take action against anyone who misrepresents that it's an FDIC-insured bank. I understand, Chair McWilliams, that FDIC recently proposed a rule because this has been happening more often. Is that correct? That is correct. There is a lot Thank of you. confusion. Thank you. Okay, good. I hope the FDIC cracks down on non-bank companies that mislead consumers. Yet, during your, ter- during your tenure, um, Ms. McWilliams, You've expanded the reach of non-bank financial tech firms into the banking sector, rolling back rules that make it easier for non-banks to engage in predatory lending and edge out small banks and credit unions. You've approved two industrial loan charters. At the height of the pandemic, one of these companies, Square, has a poor track record on consumer complaints, but it just announced it will buy installment lender after pay for $29 billion, significantly expanding Uh, It's lending business. We always hear promises about how financial technology and innovation will help the underbanked and foster financial inclusion, yet these promises always go unmet. Instead of doing favors for big business, it's your job to protect consumers and depositors whose hard-earned money is ultimately at stake. Now, Mr. Sue, a question for you. Over the last several years, the Fed's vice chair of supervision, Mr. Quarles, led the effort to weaken capital requirements, as you know, for the largest banks through changes to stress test models and so-called tailoring of the stress capital buffer. The Fed has also announced that it plans to seek comment on changes to leverage requirements at the biggest banks. Will you work to reverse the damage, Mr. Sue, the Fed has done and urge for higher capital requirements in the biggest banks? Uh, Maintaining strong capital requirements is an imperative. Uh, It is important that the banking system remain a source of strength for the economy. Uh, and that they uh, have the highest, they are held to the highest standards. Okay. I'll take that as a yes. Uh, that, let me ask you one other question. Thanks first. Thank you again, as I mentioned in opening remarks, for starting the process of rescinding uh, your predecessor's misguided Community Rest Reinvestment Act rule. When Chair Powell was before this committee recently and a number of times over the last month and then a number of times he said the Fed was committed to interagency comprehensive CRA modernization and that the Fed and the OCC were jointly reviewing comments on the Fed's proposal. Uh, So two questions. Does the OCC share the Fed's commitment to comprehensive CRA modernization? And second, what do you think the timing will be for this proposal? Uh, we, we do share the commitment, um, uh, and we do with the, with the Fed and with the FDIC. Uh, we've all c- committed together publicly uh, that we'll be working together to strengthen and modernize the CRA. In terms of timing, um, it's hard to give an exact set of dates around that. There is a lot of urgency. I can say I can I can say I can uh, share that the teams are working very quickly. Uh, we have given uh, internal kind of aggressive uh, timelines on that, but it is a complicated rule. Uh, we want to make sure that we do it right. Uh, and, and so that we will be working with all deliberate speed. It's important you do it. It's important you do it right, of course. Thank you. Senator Toomey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Su, in statements to the press, you suggested that the OCC's regulatory review would include the three conditional approvals the agency issued to national trust banks that provide digital asset custody services approvals that, according to the OCC itself, can only be revoked if there's a material change to the information on which the agency relied. These approvals, which were granted only after extensive engagement analysis, would presumably improve safety and soundness and reduce risk by bringing digital asset activity into the regulated banking system. In recognition of these benefits, just last week, the U.S. Marshals selected one of these institutions, Anchorage Digital, as its provider of digital asset custody for seized digital assets, shouldn't we be encouraging more innovative financial in- institutions, including those that provide digital asset-, asset custody services, to enter into the regulating banking system if they choose? And wouldn't that tend to result in increased oversight? So I am very supportive of responsible innovation. Um, the purpose of the review is to make sure that we're taking a holistic approach to both chartering and to the regulatory perimeter to m- ensure that um, there's not regulatory arbitrage across different agencies, 
uh, and that there's not a race to the bottom and a, and a shadow banking system. So we're trying to bent away all of these things. They're currently on an interagency basis. We have this digital asset sprint initiative. Which okay, I've got very limited time. I just I want to stress this, though. Um, it, it seems to me companies operating in this space, in many cases, they want to play by rules. They want to be regulated. They want to comply. Um, I think it does a lot of damage to the credibility of the OCC. It's damages economically. When an institution receives an approval, stands up an operational business, complies with the conditions under which the approval was granted, and then it's subject to being pulled out from under them. Are you saying that the career staff at the OCC got it wrong and didn't take these things into consideration when they uh, issued this approval? No, we're, we're reviewing this cognizant of, uh, uh, of the standards and the practices of the past. Um, we're, we're doing this in order to be holistic and to ensure that we're making this decision in coordination with other agencies. Well, I, I would just urge you to keep it very much in front of mind that they went through a full-blown due process, bona fide process, and people ought to be able to plan on when they get approval, they can actually engage in the business that was approved. I would also want to just say briefly, the CRA review, I think it was a big mistake, um, to, uh, to be reconsidering the CRA. It had been 25 years, and the updates were mostly about providing clarity, objectivity, and transparency. Can you commit to retaining those principles, clarity, objectivity, and transparency in whatever direction this new rule goes? Yes, in addition to strengthening and modernizing, as part of strengthening and modernizing the CRA, yes, I can commit to that. Um, very quickly, um, You've made several references to climate risks and eventually banks having to uh, have new capital rules, which presumably means increased capital requirement to deal with climate risk. Um, as you know, capital requirements are designed to absorb losses that can occur in the short run, but climate scenario analysis is really about 50 and 100 year scenarios. Do you know of a single expert who can tell any of us how climate change is going to affect banks in, say, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania next year? Uh, our focus right now is on, uh, is on risk management, the safety and soundness related to risk management. Um, and so really it is about uh, recognizing that climate change presents risk management challenges and that banks need to prepare for both the physical and the transition risks related to climate change. Okay. Well, let me put it this way. Are you aware of any banks that have failed in the United States due to Superstorm Sandy, Hurricane Andrew, California wildfires. Can you name a bank that failed as a result of not having planned for extreme weather events? Uh, I cannot think of uh, any at this uh, point. Ne neither can I, and we've had a lot of extreme weather events over recent decades. So I would suggest that banks are probably aware of risks that they run. Um, uh, Chairman McWilliams, I was glad to see the FDIC's recent request for information on digital assets. I think there's a tremendous potential benefits to consumers, to our economy, that comes from this distributed ledger technology, which could have all kinds of really constructive applications. Could you just share for us what have you learned from banks and other financial institutions about some of the ways in which they're using this technology? Thank you, Senator Toomey, for that question. Um, uh, as you may know, the comment period closed on July 16th. We're reviewing comments. And um, th there's a lot of encouraging information, frankly, on how technology can benefit our banking system. One of the main responses we have gotten so far is about the benefits of the interbank um, uh, payment uh, network and the benefits that that can provide to entities that are within the network. I also think, if, if I may just add a personal uh, note to this, the 20th century was America's century. The 21st century will not be America's century if we're not open to innovation and allowing our companies to compete with international competitors. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I think Senator Chairman, Senator Tester of Montana is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Toomey. And I would tell you, uh, Senator Toomey, we do agree. I do think we need a nominee for the OCC so we can vote on them and confirm. And since I'm a Democrat, you can put that down in the book, okay? <laughs> <laughs> for for extreme weather events, I, I would also say this. Um, this is an interesting year to talk about extreme weather. West of the Mississippi, we're pretty much generally in a drought. East of the Mississippi, generally, we've got more rain than we need. And uh, we've burnt 3 million acres so far in the West, uh, and the fire season has just started. Um, I would hope that folks look at extreme weather events because they're happening with more regularity, and I think it would be... Um, 
it, it would just be improper for them not to not to take a look at it because it's it's getting to be a fact of life every year something weird is happening um, I've said this before maybe not in this committee but I've been on this will be our 44th harvest it will be our worst harvest by far by far not just a little bit but by far if it gets any worse I won't even take the combine out of the shed uh, that's how bad it is uh, I want to thank you all for being here for your testimony um, uh, this is for uh, uh, Ms. McWilliams and uh, for, for you, Mr. Sue. Um, you're, you're talking about the Community Reinvestment Act. You're talking about uh, you're going to work together to update it. Uh, will each of you commit to uh, consider the unique needs in rural America as you update the CRA? Absolutely, Senator. That was one of my focal points uh, last time around. Thank you. Yes. And will you also incorporate the needs of Indian country because it's kind of a different world when we're talking rural? Um, and uh, could I get your commitment for that? Absolutely. And we're also working on how to help Native American uh, minority depository institutions because we know that they're a lifeblood in this I appreciate that. Likewise, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I live in a little town. It's got about 600 people in it. Uh, we had a bank. Uh, called Wells Fargo. Uh, they pulled their branches out of a lot of small towns around. We were lucky. Uh, we got a community bank that stepped in and took over that portfolio. Uh, but the truth is we all know that uh, capital is pretty important for a small community. And uh, as I said, if we would not have been so lucky, it certainly would have been a, another death knell in our small community. So as regulators... Uh, how will you ensure that financial institutions that you regulate will continue to serve rural and frontier communities, or do you not think that's part of your job? I'm, I'm happy to go first. Uh, it is, um, I would say, uh, the focal point of my job. I, I consider my job at the FDIC not just to preserve the safety and soundness of our banking system and financial stability and protect depositors uh, and make sure we can resolve banks, but to ensure that community banks can survive, especially in communities where we have 400, 600 people. Uh, we have done a number of things to make sure that the regulatory burden is commensurate with the risk profile of those institutions. We have focused on institutions uh, in terms of their size and making sure that our examiners appropriately regulate them as, as they go to examine them. Quite often, these small banks have a staff of 10. Okay. And when we send three examiners in the state, since three, they have six people sitting there for, th for, for three weeks looking at their books. So, Senator, I'm, I'm more than happy to give you a briefing on all the efforts we have done, but we have focused specifically on capital, liquidity, and regulations. Appreciate that. And hopefully you're doing that in the cyber realm, too. Is yes. It, is it involved? Thank you. Go ahead. NCUA. Absolutely. I, I think we're doing a number of things. First of all, you have to remember that one in two credit unions are low-income credit unions, and many low-income credit unions are located in rural areas, and we work to support them with grants um, and other activities. Um, two, like the FDIC, we also scale our regulations based on size as well as our supervision program. And then finally, one thing that uh, we've been doing very recently is strongly encouraging all credit unions that are eligible uh, to step up and step in and be part of the emergency capital investment program that's being put together by Treasury. We've had about 50 credit unions that have applied for secondary capital. Um, that low dollar capital over a period of time has the potential really to help rural areas as well as urban areas. And, and how do you ensure that they have a physical branch here? Some people are locked in the 70s like I am, and I like to walk into a brick-and-mortar place. Uh, I, I completely understand that, and I, I certainly remember as a kid walking to uh, my local branch uh, in order to make some deposit of money. Um, one of the things we do is, again, by working to make sure that we right scale our regulations so that they can continue to have that branch. Um, but also, too, for underserved areas in particular, we have a requirement under the service facilities requirement that you have to have a physical location in the area. So if you want to serve it, you need to have a branch. That is one way we work to do that. Well, I just want to thank you all for the work you do. And, and I didn't get into my cyber questions, so I'll probably submit some for the record. Thank you all very, very much. Uh, thank you, Senator Tester. Uh, Senator Shelby, who's recognized, who told me earlier today, this is his 35th year on the committee. Thank so, you. Senator Shelby, in some of those years, we're with chair. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, despite the challenges caused by the pandemic, our banking system overall has remained resilient with strong capital and liquidity levels. From 
But from 2008 to 2013, during the midst of the financial crisis, 489 FDIC-insured banks failed. In comparison, since March of 2020, it's my understanding that only three banks have failed during that period. So, um, Chairman McWilliams, you deserve some credit, you and your, your, the FDIC board. Much credit for the efforts here, I believe. What is your assessment, ma'am, on banks' resiliency during the COVID-19 and now? And what uh, do you credit for the ability to withstand the effects of the pandemic? Thank you, Senator Shelby, and I want to congratulate you on your 31st 35th anniversary. Um, <laughs> Long I like, time. I would like to think that the years when I spent on the committee supporting you count for two, but we'll, we'll go with 35. Um, I will say that uh, I, I, I was guided by my experience as a consumer protection attorney at the Federal Reserve during 2007, 8, 9, and 10, and we fielded a number, hundreds of consumer calls during that time. So when the pandemic came upon us, um, I was not going to allow the same calls to come through. And so we started placing calls early to banks, asking them to work with their customers. We were, in fact, the first agency to issue a statement encouraging banks to work with their borrowers. Then we worked with our fellow regulators to negotiate with FASB to make sure that loans that are modified for the purposes of the pandemic that were performing prior to the pandemic were not classified as trouble debt restructuring. And I would say that was the single most important thing we did early on in the pandemic. This was early March to make sure that banks can modify loans and work with their customers. We have done a number of things to allow banks to dip into their capital buffers to make sure that the capital, uh, access to capital and credit flows to their local economies. We were concerned about small businesses shutting down as the government shutdowns are, uh, around the country became prevalent. And so I would say we were all hands on deck to make sure that the lessons learned from 2008 do not get repeated and that we are proactively engaged in what I subsequently used the professional term for. I called it the regulatory whack-a-mole. We tried to whack it before it showed up. And uh, as a result of that, we actually have been able to prevent bank failures. And we only had three banks fail during the pandemic and none due to the pandemic. Do you know of any bank that has uh, had, has been well capitalized, well managed, and well regulated that has failed? Not to my best knowledge, Senator. Um, what do you think is currently that you're monitoring, as you can tell us here, could be potential problems for the banking system in the economy? So we're looking, Senator, at a, at a number of um, factors that um, are frankly unprecedented in nature. The pandemic, we saw um, in Q2 of last year about a 33% dr uh, drop in our gross domestic product on an annualized basis. That was a tremendous shock to our economy and to our banking system. We're also looking at unprecedented uh, um, uh, congressional actions to make sure that different packages of stimulus get distributed to the economy. Uh, we're, we're cognizant of the potential for inflation uh, down the road. And as somebody who um, came from a country where hyperinflation in early 90s was, I think, in about 113 trillion percent, I'm personally very sensitive to this issue. Uh, we're also looking at cybersecurity risk, and we're also looking at commercial real estate and with the new normal and how the pandemic um, changes the, the, the ability of people to work, um, what does that mean for the bottom line for banks and the commercial properties? If the threat, uh, our specter of inflation is a threat to our economy, and every, is it also a threat to the banking system? Well, certainly it's, it's a complex picture for banks. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that um, with the rising interest rates, um, um, the net interest margin on banks would probably fare better than it does with low interest rates, but the asset quality uh, may deteriorate because people may not be able to make their payments, especially low and moderate income communities uh, that we have been trying to help, uh, especially hard during the pandemic. What is the uh, status of the FDIC reserve fund? So it's never been healthier. It's close to $120 billion. Um, because so much money flow to the bank, our deposit reserve ratio is below the statutory mandate, and we are on a path to uh, get back to, to where we need to be at 1.35%. But I will tell you that the fund has never been healthier than it is today. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Thanks, Senator Shelby. Senator Warner is recognized for five minutes from Virginia. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, one of the issues from my work on the Banking Committee and on the Intel Committee. I want to thank the Chairman and particularly Senator Crapo. I think we did a, some good work last session on the Anti-Money Laundering Act, which I know all of you have mentioned in your, in your testimonies. And 
maybe I'll start with you, Mr. Sue, and then go down the list. How would you characterize the implementation to date? I mean, this is a big bill. You know, we've also got lots and lots of questions around beneficial ownership. You know, how are we going to get this prioritized at an appropriate time? And if also you could talk, and I think, Mr. Sue, you probably the have the most on this, but I'd love to hear from the other panelists as well. How do we make sure the examiners are going to have the skill knowledge, this, it, it, will there be additional training? So talk about implementation and then talk about it down to the level of the examiners, particularly since there's going to be so much more interaction with FinCEN now. Sure. Um, so it, it, there's been a lot of collaboration with FinCEN, the, the FDIC and other agencies particularly uh, on identification of the priorities, defining those priorities, and then that cascades through to what are the how are the examiners going to approach that, and there's a lot of training manuals. There's a lot of work being done to ensure that... Will there actually be additional training for the examiners? Um, I, I, I believe so. I'd have to check with staff exactly how that's going to get played out. Um, but I know right now there's a lot of focus on, on getting these priorities out um, uh, and ensuring that uh, these pending deadlines that are, that are coming up to get these things done are, are met uh, to, the, to the ability that we can. It is complex. There is some complexity there. Um, but we've been working on an interagency basis with FinCEN to get those things done. We'd, I'd like to get a more regular update. Maybe I can reach out to all of you. Absolutely. This is something I'm very concerned about. Chairman McWilliams, it's great to see you again. Nice to see and, you. And um, could you and Chairman Harper also comment on this? Sure, sure. Um, um, like like uh, Acting Comptroller Sue said, we're working collaboratively. We, we understand the importance. I can tell you that banks, especially small banks, really desperately want to comply. Rules are very complex. Uh, we will provide whatever examination training we need to provide to our, our workforce to make sure that uh, they can work with our supervised entities to reduce some of the regulatory burden while providing clarity and a path to get a better system in place. And, and I would just add that in addition to uh, what all uh, my fellow regulators have said, we are meeting on a monthly basis at the principal's level along with uh, staff in order to make sure that coordination continues to go on. Staff is working and meeting at least weekly on different work streams. Um, we, too, will conduct the necessary education we certainly make BSA and AML compliance a priority for us. It's a supervisory priority this year, and I imagine it will continue to be in the future. Well, I may follow up for the record with some specific questions about this implementation. I want to make sure we stay on this, get it right, and very much approve, appreciate all your actions. I'm going to start at the other end now with you, Chair Harper. You know, one of the things uh, back from the December COVID relief bill that I was very proud of, and again, worked with the uh, many members of the committee, but particularly uh, uh, Senator Crapo won, was making sure that we make additional investments in CDFIs and MDIs, the so-called ESIP program. Uh, a lot of credit unions um, fall into this category, and you know I do appreciate uh, the attention that you've played uh, with credit unions in, in um, educating them and making sure they are aware of the ESIP program and how we... Um, um, you know, are, are able to participate. Uh, and I think particularly because since credit unions can't take tier one capital, you're taking secondary capital. Um, and I just, on an overall basis, as we try to get additional capital into these institutions that, you know, CDFIs serve low and moderate income communities, they have been disproportionately hit by COVID, you know, speak to me as how we can make sure that you can continue to lean forward without um, violating the safety and soundness requirements. And then so I can get my question and get at least get from you and Chair McWilliams. One of the things I really enjoyed when we met and spent time together, if you could give me a quick update on your mission, mission fund efforts. So Chair Harper and then Chair uh, so McWilliams. Um, certainly the entire board has been committed to getting education out on the ECIP. And in fact, last time I checked, we had about 47 credit unions uh, that had applied for secondary capital at $1.6 billion. We're working hand in glove with the Treasury Department, which has to approve on its side the grant, but then we need to take and make sure that the capital can be used for secondary capital purposes. That is the way we are able to, if you will, accommodate the ECIP within the system. This is low dollar, um, uh, low interest, long-term stable capital. Um, we recognize that in the last crisis, credit unions that leaned in and uh, lended out to low-income communities actually recovered more quickly, and that's one of the messages we've been carrying. 
my time is up, but Chairman McWilliams, could you be sure, briefly sure. about Mission Fund? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, um, um, uh, Senator. The Mission Driven Bank Fund is actually a novel approach. It took uh, some regulatory thinking outside of the box to come up with the idea of a private fund that would be backed by the uh, FDIC in name and reputation, but would uh, basically uh, get private investments from uh, companies, banks, et cetera, to support minority institutions, whether CDFIs or minority depository institutions, banks. Uh, early on in my tenure, I realized capital is what these entities need the most, plus technical assistance, and the fund will provide both. Uh, we're in the process of rolling out the fund. Everything moves slowly through the government procurement process, but uh, we're looking forward to having it up and standing by the end of the year, and we already have close to $200 million in private commitments. Thanks, Senator Warren. Senator Tillis from North Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, uh, Chair McWilliams and Acting Comptroller Sue, uh, I really do believe that risk-based pricing powered by data analytics enables an accurate assessment of a consumer's credit worthiness, uh, which I think is critical for lenders who want to seek or provide quality credit options to safeguard against the risk of default. Uh, the less credit worthy, who previously have been denied credit, can now receive appropriately priced credit, in my opinion. I believe the Chamber of Commerce recently reported that historically underserved populations, including people of color, have seen greater access to credit under a risk-based system. So I also think it's good uh, for the banking uh, system to have a risk-based assessment for properly pricing the product. Uh, we saw the damage that can occur when we have lax regulations that uh, was at least in part responsible for the 2008 financial crisis. So, Chair McWilliams, as a regulator charged with resolving banks that fail, do you believe a risk-based <clears throat> do you believe risk-based pricing is a, a very important tool? Uh, yes, I do. And frankly, Senator, when I got my first credit card in the United States 30 years ago, that probably would not have been possible if uh, that wasn't um, in place. Mm -hmm. And. Acting Comptroller Sue? I do, and I think one of the exciting developments and innovations is using other uh, additional data to inform those risk based mm -hmm. assessments. The um, uh, Chairman Harper, uh, we talked just before the hearing. It's amazing that the two years have uh, moved by on your term. I know you're in the uh, chairman role. Your underlying term has expired. Is that correct? Yes. Um, Kind of curious about your posture uh, moving ahead. Uh, will you commit to hold any significant regulations such as climate change until your successor is nominated and confirmed? So, uh, you know, certainly uh, we as a board, I view it that we're a board and that we need to develop consensus in interacting with one another. Um, in fact, since I've uh, joined the board with uh, board member Hood, we've voted together more than 90% of the time, and that is the way in which I operate. Um, I think we do need to gather education and information. Uh, I am not looking to move quickly towards any regulation here, but I believe a, a proper first step would be for uh, a request for information on the area of climate change before we would move anywhere. Thank you. Uh, another topic uh, that's come up recently is an independent agency. Do you plan to follow President Biden's executive order to require NCUA staff to get vaccinated or submit to regular testing? Uh, so actually, I think it's a recommendation of a task force, not an executive order, and we are currently evaluating it. Um, I do rec respect our independence, however. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Till. Senator Warren from Massachusetts is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So in recent years, our banking sector has become more and more dominated by the largest banks. <coughs> Community banks are being gobbled up by larger competitors or forced to shut down because they can't compete on a level playing field. This results in more concentration, in higher costs for consumers, and in increased systemic risks for our financial system, and fewer total banks. These transactions are happening in plain view of the federal agencies whose job it is to keep our system safe and competitive. In fact, every single bank merger requires affirmative approval from the Department of Justice and a banking regulator. Banking regulators like the people we have in front of us today. So Chair McWilliams, the FDIC has a searchable database of all merger applications the agency has received since 2013. That's over seven years now. Do you know how many merger applications the FDIC has received in that time? Uh, I don't have the exact number. I do. Uh, it's 1,124. 
Chair McWilliams, how many mergers out of those 1,124 did the FDIC deny? Total number of denials for any reason whatsoever. Um, I don't have that number, Senator, but I know that we go through the statutory process required. I, I do have the number. Okay. It's zero. So this isn't just a problem at the FDIC. The FDIC, the Federal Reserve, and the OCC combined have not formally denied a single bank merger in 15 years. Merger review has become the definition of a rubber stamp, and the banks know it. And it's time for some changes. So just saying we're going to get tougher on this is not likely to persuade anyone, and certainly not a multi-billion dollar bank. Bright lines could help set a new tone. So let me ask you, Acting Controller Sue, are banking agencies like yours currently required to reject mergers when the resulting bank will be bigger or more complex than our banking rules are set up to handle? Are they required? That's my question. I believe one of the statutory factors for bank merger review involves financial stability. I, I'm, I'm not asking the question, may you consider. I'm asking, I'm looking for bright lines here. Are you required to reject a merger? I don't believe so, but I would have to check with my general. Well, I think the answer is no, you're not required. So you may want to look again. Let me ask about another possible bright line. What if the banks trying to merge don't receive the highest ratings in their Community Reinvestment Act exams to measure how well they're serving their communities? Are you required to reject a merger then? I don't believe so. No, you're not. So how about one more bright line? What if the merger could result in increased costs for consumers because of a lack of competition? Are you required to reject the merger then? I don't believe so. So the data here show that regulators have no credibility on mergers. And sure, there are rules under which you review mergers, but in practice, for 15 years now, this is turned into a check-the-box exercise where the outcome has been predetermined. Merger review has become a rubber stamp. That's why I was happy to see that President Biden's competition executive order called on the banking agencies to revamp their merger review guidelines to put an end to rubber stamping. And soon I'll be reintroducing my Bank Merger Review Modernization Act with Congressman Garcia to revamp the bank merger process and strengthen and modernize the standards under which mergers are considered. Our regulators have a job to do, and it's our job here in Congress to make sure that they do it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Warren. Uh, Senator Cortez Masto is recognized from Nevada for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Toomey. Um, let's talk about extreme weather. Um, it's on, uh, happening all over the West, particularly right now, if not the rest of the country. Chairman Harper, let me start with you and your written testimony. You noted that climate change may exacerbate concentration risks for some credit unions. How is NCUA identifying uh, and working with these credit unions to reduce concentration risks that could be affected by wildfires, floods, or other extreme weather events? And what are these concentration risks that you mentioned? So when you go in and we look at and uh, supervise a credit union, we will take a look at where its loans are. And in one of the areas where you want to take a look at is maybe there are a number of homes within the floodplain or primarily within a floodplain, or maybe it's an area that is more prone to wildfires. Is the credit union taking risk mitigation techniques to make sure that there is insurance there behind the product in order to protect their interest in the equity um, uh, for which they've made the loan to? Uh, that's a little bit of the way that we're looking at it. Um, I, I tend to think about extreme weather events um, in a slightly different way in climate change as we're happening. And it's my hometown uh, that I think about. I grew up two miles from a major refinery in this country. Uh, there's a credit union tied to that refinery. Uh, what happens over time 
as that refinery perhaps changes its product line or, or moves on to something else? Does the credit union need to change its base on its field of membership? Or just two blocks from where I grew, there was a major cornstarch processor taking corn and turning it. What happens when the communities that are affected by the weather events, uh, what happens to the credit union that's, that's connected with that cornstarch processor? So you, you, I'm taking a look at the micro and the macro level as we approach this issue. That's wonderful, and, and I, I look forward to the work that you're doing because in Nevada, in the West, as you well know, wildfires are just, it, it's, it's a daily thing now. And yeah, no, and I know that... having a devastating impact um, to, to our families, our structures, our businesses, our small businesses that are farmers and ranches on the rangeland. So I, I, I'm hoping that is part of your focus as well. A absolutely, and I know last year when we had the wildfires, we had a number of credit unions that applied for urgent needs grants because, for example, their HVA systems were completely destroyed as a result of the wildfire, and they needed, and we helped to fund and make sure that those small credit unions could get access to that. Great. Thank you. Um, Acting Comptroller Sue, um, in your written testimony, you recommend the OCC adopt a two-pronged approach to climate change. Uh, my question to you is, how will you impl implement your two-pronged approach? And I'm curious, what is your vision for the climate change risk officer? Ah. Uh, so the first prong is to work with our partners uh, and to share best practices. So we joined NGFS, as I mentioned earlier, the network for greening the financial system. Um, there is a lot to learn. There's a, there's a, there's a lot of different – banks have lots of different kinds of exposures. And so uh, it helps – to work together with other agencies and our partners to learn what are the best practices. Um, and the NGFS is a good forum, it is the leading forum by which to share those best practices. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. That, that's a very important thing. We're also working with our uh, interagency partners, uh, particularly the Federal Reserve, which has a, has a climate uh, officer there as well. Um, the vision for the climate officer is to really expand our capacity to work with those stakeholders and to work with banks. Because the bank's risk management practices, some are developed, some are underdeveloped. Uh, we need resources to help accelerate the, the development and adoption of uh, effective climate change risk management practices. Uh, and the new uh, risk officer, uh, Darren Benhart, will help with that. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and, and you mentioned, I guess this is my question um, for Ms. McWilliam. Um, what are you doing to address the climate crisis? And, and um, Acting Comptroller Sue just talked about joining the network for greening the financial system. Is that something you're considering? Is that, can you talk a little bit about your thoughts? Ar sure, around sure. That? Happy to. Thank yeah. you, Senator. Um, so as, as you know, we're a primary regulator of small banks in the United States. As a matter of fact, 84% of our banks' uh, regulated entities fall under $1 billion in assets, and a lot of them are actually, frankly, serving small communities like the rural communities in Nevada. Uh, for, for decades, I can't even take credit for this, but for decades, our supervisors have taken into account weather-related events. And as Chairman Harper mentioned, uh, to the extent that you're in a flood zone or parallel wind zone or fire zone, um, our uh, examiners expect banks to take that into their underwriting practices. Uh, we have regional risk council. Uh, we have six regional offices, and in each office we have a regional risk council. They look at this issue based on that uh, region. So in, in your region, in Nevada, California, et cetera, that fires would be earthquakes, et cetera, a prevalent issue to consider droughts as well uh, for agricultural uh, um, um, lending, et cetera. So we're cognizant of uh, the issues here. We know what our entities need to do. Our entities know what they need to do. And if they are not following uh, prudent underwriting practices, protecting the collateral, making sure there is appropriate cash flow resulting from um, um, their loans at, and the businesses that they support, they would be cited in the examinations. We are a part of the Basel Task Force on Climate Change, and we're also working through AFSOC with our sister agencies on understanding how best to attack that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you to all three of you. Appreciate the conversation. Thank Thanks, Senator Cortez Maso. Senator Scott from South Carolina is recognized. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Uh, thank you all for being here with us today and want to ask a couple of questions. Uh, Chairman McWilliams, the FDIC has, long, has a long history of working with banks, including mission-driven institutions, to develop policies that support broader access to the financial system. Late last year, your agency announced efforts to develop a revolutionary mission-driven bank fund to create a streamlined pathway for private sector and philanthropic investment in FDIC-insured MDIs and CDFIs, this novel approach has the potential to affect positively millions of folks. Can you provide us with a brief update on the mission-driven bank fund 
and other recent economic inclusion developments at your agency? Thank you, Senator, and thank you for calling it revolutionary because I, I sometimes feel that's literally what it took to get it uh, set up at the FDIC uh, after I watched an episode of Shark Tank <laughs> on, on a plane and thought, why don't we have a Shark Tank for uh, minority banks? Uh, and that's how the idea about this mission-driven find really, really was born. Um, we, we, we had to search statutory authorities to make sure that uh, we stay within our preserve and promote mandate for MDIs and CDFIs. And uh, this mission-driven bank fund is in the process of being set up. We have a fund advisor. We're going to be able to um, actually commence the opening of the fund by before the year end. We have close to $200 million in private commitments. And uh, I will be uh, uh, restless uh, advocating for investments in this fund through the rest of my tenure because, frankly, it may be one of the most significant things we have done for minority banks, especially for African-American banks that have um, the lack access to capital, and this is going to be huge to move the needle for those banks. I can also tell you that um, I have uh, taken the issue of minority depository institutions very seriously. We created, uh, we increased uh, representation of minority banks on our community bank advisory council. We created uh, an, uh, an MDI uh, subcommittee so that they can share best practices. We have created, um, I call it speed dating for, non, uh, for uh, MDIs and non-MDIs to basically uh, highlight the benefit of teaming up with an MDI. We clarified that investments in MDIs for non-MDIs result in CRA credit. Uh, we have created a marketing campaign to promote the, um, the, the, the nature uh, and, and the scope of minority banks in the United States. And I can assure you that until the day I'm in this chair, I will, I will focus on this uh, as one of my main issues at the FDIC. Well, you have done a really good job of making sure that, A, we stay in consistent communication about the important issues around MDIs, CDFIs, to make sure that there's greater access for folks who are credit worthy to find a path forward. And it's one of the things that we can do better, and you have fr frankly been a champion of doing it better, which is to find ways from a credit worthy perspective to pull resources to create access to small business. Uh, entrepreneurs like myself depend on that access, and you're doing it in the most effective way possible. And I really appreciate that, that approach. Uh, Thank for, you. For, for all three of y'all on the panel, uh, it was a couple of years ago when I led the Republican Banking Committee colleagues on a letter encouraging regulatory harmonization and coordination from the CFPB, OCC, Fed, FDIC, and NCUA to create a consistent small-dollar lending framework across all institu institutions in order to promote and expand small-dollar lending and, and credit options. Uh, that's why I'm especially excited today by your agency's issuance of joint small dollar lending principles last year. Is there an update to that uh, approach? And can I get more information about what you all are doing uh, on the very important issue of small dollar lending for folks uh, throughout the nation? I'll start there. Um, first of all, within the NCUA, we allow federal credit unions to make what we call payday alternative loans. These are uh, low dollar loans up to two thousand uh, dollars up to one year to pay it back um, uh, Generally done at no higher than 28 percent Interest rate plus up to a fee of up to twenty dollars in it. What we have found is that these uh, Loans are performing generally well. Uh, I believe that the delinquencies in the last quarter uh, were approximately two and a half two point six percent um, and that uh, the uh, charge-offs were in the neighborhood of about 5% overall on these loans. Um, for us, these small-dollar loans are often a gateway uh, in order to get people into the financial system. And I'll also make one other observation. When the crisis first hit, we saw many credit unions step up and do 0% small-dollar loans for 90 days, then rising up to perhaps 5% because they were so focused on serving their members. Excellent. Thank you. Mr. Hu? Yeah, I think it's so. The issue is extremely important for us um, under Project Reach, which I believe you had a, a role in uh, uh, sponsoring. Yes, a couple of work streams there, which really hit on this. So the first is on credit invisibles, forty-five million people uh, who don't have a credit score. Yep, There's, that work stream has really taken off, and so there are both uh, banks, community groups, civil rights groups have gotten together and really worked to figure out. What are the alternative data sources that can bring them into the mainstream financial system? So that's been a huge effort. The other is on MDIs and on small businesses. Those are two other work streams. So on MDIs, um, 23 banks have signed the MDI pledge, half a billion dollars, technical assistance partnerships. And on small businesses, 
consortium lending, other efforts to basically make these dollars available. Thank you. Oh, if we have the time, I would be happy to tell well, you that we I'm have not focused. Sure that I do, but we'll 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 keep talking until uh, Chairman Brown says <laughs> stop. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll speak very fast. Um, we have focused. This, this has been one of the of the focuses, um, or, or foci, I should say, uh, when I joined the FDIC, because frankly, we had a disjointed agency approach. The Fed had supervisory letters. OCC had a bulletin from 2018. FDIC had a rule from 2015, and then there was the CFPB rule. And when you have so much uncertainty in the regulatory framework. You know what the regulated entities do? They don't do it. And so it was important for us to hold our hands together and uh, be willing to sit at the table and come up with a joint process to issue this guidance, which, frankly, I'm so grateful was commenced back in 2018 when I joined the FDIC because by 2020 we were able to issue that guidance and encourage small business, I mean, a small dollar lending, um, uh, and the pandemic was upon us. So thank you for, for, for your support of this. Absolutely. I'll just uh, finish with this, Mr. Chairman, the fact that. Uh, Mr. Sue was uh, alluding to the fact that there's a way to find those who are credit invisible uh, and bring them to light. And one of the things I want to note is that oftentimes those who are credit invisible may be credit worthy. So the question really isn't a question about whether or not they deserve access to the opportunity to be banked and have access to the loans. The question is can we, through the breadcrumbs in their portfolio, find the rent payments and the other things that would tell us that they will be uh, high, have a high success rate as it relates to helping those who are credit worthy become credit visible. Uh, and in South Carolina, that's a, I think the number was around 17 to 20 percent mm. of the folks in my state uh, find themselves credit invisible. So thank you for your thank work. Thank you, Senator Scott. I will take Mr. Sue's head nodding as his answer, if that's okay with you. Senator Smith is right. I'd like another three minutes, sir. Yeah, you would. <laughs> Next, next hearing, Senator Scott. Point of order, Senator Scott. <laughs> uh, thank you, thank you, Chair Brown, and thanks so much to our panelists. And I actually appreciate the uh, the questions that Senator um, Scott is asking. And maybe I'll follow up on this a little bit with a just tilted a little bit more towards the um, the CRA. So we all know, of course, that COVID has not been the great equalizer. We've seen it has hit hardest um, those that um, are already struggling with the inequities in our uh, in our country. Um, including frontline workers and elders and black and brown and indigenous communities, communities of color. I read a number today that I thought demonstrates this and was so surprising to me. The National Bureau of Economic Research says that since the start of the pandemic, the number of black business owners dropped by 41 percent compared to a 17 percent decline um, for white business owners. So clearly we need to take intentional steps. Uh, to address this challenge. Um, so I'm glad to see the OCC and the FDIC and the Fed are all coming together, committed to working jointly on a uh, CRA final rule. And I want to just ask um, you, Mr. Sue, if you could talk to us a little bit about how the CRA can be strengthened to specifically help address this uh, gap in um, minority business ownership that we see in this data. Okay, so... Um one thing I've learned is that the CRA is a complicated rule. <laughs> so um, there are many, I think there are many things that we can do. Uh, we currently have groups that are, are, are working uh, pretty much around the clock uh, on, on coming up with options to strengthen uh, the CRA uh, to make sure that low and moderate income communities have their needs met. Uh, there are a lot of tech, I'm happy to have uh, uh, further briefings with you, kind of walk through some of those details. There, there, I, I have found the complexity to be, um, both interesting, and it's, I think this is why on an interagency basis it's so important that we do this together so there's clarity and consistency uh, in, how it's, in how it's done and so that uh, uh, banks and community groups uh, are, are, have those needs met. Thank you. And I'm, I'm going to, um, Ms. McWilliams, I'm going to come back to you in this. Just I'm going to dive in a little bit deeper on, um, on something uh, here. Uh, uh, earlier this year in May, I chaired a subcommittee hearing focused on the housing needs of Native Americans, and we saw here in this committee um, that one of the major barriers to accessing affordable home ownership um, and housing in general on tribal lands is the lack of lending on tribal lands. There's, of course, a lot of complexity about lending on tribal lands, and bank and credit institutions have many fewer branches um, on tribal lands, leading to a high percentage of unbanked um, households in these communities. Um, a 
According to a 2016 report commissioned by uh, Treasury, uh, CRA funds are rarely directed to Native communities, even though Native CDFIs would meet the CRA uh, criteria. So could you comment on this and what more we could do in this area? And I'd love to hear from both um, um, Mr. Sue and also uh, Ms. McWilliams. Mr. Sue, would you like to go first? Sure. Um, so there have been some studies indicating that uh, CRA requirements have slowed the, uh, the debranching, if you will, uh, in certain areas. So I think that that is an interesting uh, factor that's being taken into account as, as the teams are kind of working through um, how to strengthen uh, and modernize the CRA. Um, you know, branching is very, very important. We did have, there was an interesting meeting uh, that we've had. We've been meeting with lots of different groups, and there was the head uh, uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a bank that serves the, those populations and noted that it's a blend. Branches are necessary, but also digital, because of the geographic distances involved with, it, with those communities, improving kind of digital uh, technology is also equally important. So we were trying to find ways to meet all of the needs of those communities uh, uh, through all, of, all of the different options. Thank you. Ms. McWilliams? Uh, thank you, Senator, for that question. Frankly, it's something that um, I have taken um, to heart. Uh, and in large part because I had an opportunity to drive through a number of, of uh, Native American lands throughout the United States and, and saw the, the, the communities and the economic impact in those communities, and I did so actually during the pandemic, uh, which was um, staggering in many cases. We, I believe that the CRA can be a great equalizer here. We can assign different formulas for investments in uh, Native American um, uh, businesses in, in um, um, minority businesses in general, in MDIs that are Native American. We have worked extensively to make sure that they can sustain themselves and support their communities. I believe that the mission-driven bank fund that we're setting up is going to be a, um, an opportunity to, 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 I would say, be a great equalizer in this space, and we hope to solicit and, and, and be able to get even more investments in the fund so that there's more capital to be distributed. We call it patient capital because it's, the point is not the return on the capital. The point is the impact of the capital in the communities. Right. And we want to make sure that the, uh, that gets compounded and magnified through different investments. And we have also um, um, done a public relations campaign on the origin story about what MDIs, including Native American MDIs, do in their communities. I think people quite often forget that they are at the forefront of making sure those communities have access to credit. And given the, um, I would say, the rural nature of those communities, um, it, it's essential, it's absolutely essential for us as regulators to have, have utmost focus on this issue and to make sure there's funding, capital, credit, and investments flowing to those communities. So thank you for your support. Thank you. Well, Senator Scott talks about um, uh, invisible communities, people who have been, you know, invisible when it comes to credit. This is clearly the case uh, for many families living on tribal lands, and um, uh, and then you layer on top of that the complexity of, uh, of, of lending when land is held in trust, um, and it exacerbates the um, housing crisis that we see on tribal lands. So thank you. I think this is something important for us to work on as we look towards these new CRA rules. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Moran from Kansas is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Chairman McWilliams, um, I've been an advocate for a long time without sufficient success uh, for more transparency in financial regulators' examination frameworks. Uh, I've introduced a bill in numerous Congresses that we've worked to, to get enacted into law, uh, exam fairness legislation. We've had conversations uh, about that. I've had conversations with your predecessor about that. I'm looking for a robust, independent uh, supervisory appeal process. And last fall, I was really pleased to see that the FDIC announced approval of a proposal to replace the current Appeals Review Committee with an independent, standalone office of supervisory appeals staffed with individuals external to the FDIC. Uh, you are taking the FDIC in a direction that I've been pursuing all regulatory uh, agencies to pursue. Would you elaborate for me where the FDIC currently stands on this uh, uh, implementation of this plan? Thank you, Senator uh, Moran, and I would say that you have been plenty successful uh, in, in many ways. Uh, during your tenure, I would say that uh, when I joined the FDIC, I focused on the appeals process uh, because, frankly, I was a little bit shocked by the numbers. Uh, between 2007 and 2000, 
2020, we had, uh, in over 13 years, we had over 110,000 exams, and we only had about 50 appeals filed on those, which uh, when I did my math and I did have to pull the calculator out for this one was 0.00045%. And so the number was just so staggeringly low that I said either something is wrong with our process or... Um, we are that good, and nobody's that good. And so we set up, uh, we solicited input on how to improve the process. We held uh, listening sessions through our uh, office of the ombudsman, external ombudsman, through our regional offices. We had roundtables. We talked to banks. We talked to, to stakeholders just to understand what all goes into the bank's decision to appeal a supervisory decision. And we have set up this new office of supervisory appeals that uh, is currently being in the process of being staffed. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, the government procurement process and the government hiring process takes a while, so we're hoping to have this office staffed before the year end and fully operational and running. But I'm, I'm hoping to have a more robust process, whatever numbers may come out of it, but I just didn't think that 0.00045% of appeals over 13 years uh, was a good representation of a robust appeals process. Well, it's been uh, disappointing to me the number of uh, financial institutions who are fearful of, of appealing, uh, find the process not workable, as, as your evidence, as your statistics demonstrate, but just nervous about being somebody who uh, appeals uh, to the FDIC or to any other regulator, regulator based upon what the consequences might be in a future exam. Mr. Sue, anything that you'd add for uh, what's happening at the OCC? Uh, I would start off by saying I believe our examiners are very, very good. I mean, we have a very intense process um, for examiners to get uh, uh, credentialed. Um, uh, it's a long training process. We have extensive uh, trainings, manuals that are published uh, as to, to ensure this fairness. Uh, we do have processes for dealing with appeals. Um, it's, it's a little bit different than what's at the FDIC, but I believe it's fair. I believe it's effective. Uh, we have oversight by multiple bodies um, to respond to complaints and, and, and things like that. So I believe overall uh, we've got a pretty good system, but we're open, always open to improvements. And so you know, open to working with your staff on, on suggestions and, and things. I thank you for that. Until uh, you said that, I'd forgotten that, uh, I don't know, 40 years ago I applied and took the FDIC examiner's examination to become one. Uh, thank you for the reminder. <laughs> uh, let me ask uh, Chairman McWilliams uh, another question. First of all, I, I would applaud your leadership in prioritizing, prioritizing modernization of the outdated broker deposit standard dictating relationships between insured depository institutions and third parties such as fintech companies. Uh, it, this occurred in the FDIC's final December rule. Um, can you explain to me and my colleagues the importance of amending Section 29 of the FDIC Act to provide FDIC as authority to modernize the broker deposit framework for community banks? Thank you, Senator. Okay. It was... For community banks. Thank you, Senator. Uh, it, it, uh, the broker deposit regulations have not been updated in 40 years uh, before this most recent update. And uh, the statute basically def defines a, um, um, uh, uh, doesn't define broker deposit, it defines uh, broker of deposits. And so it, it becomes a little bit complex for us on the regulatory side to exactly with all of the technological changes accommodate everything that's happening in that space, uh, especially with online banking channels, etc. So it was important for us to take a look at the regulations that are four decades old, uh, um, with, with a fresh eye, and we did. Um, no matter how much we try to make sure that our regulations on broker deposits keep to date with technological innovation, they're not going to be able to do so. And so one of the things that I, frankly, the only recommendation I have made to Congress uh, and, and repeatedly um, has been to update uh, the rules themselves and perhaps put a limit on the growth of troubled institutions that's not tied to broker deposits, but to allow the, you know, them to grow a certain percentage, if any, once they reach a troubled condition, uh, and not necessarily um, tied to a definition of, of assets, because they could, they could get broker deposits or they could get bad loans, and that could happen ir irrelevant of, of, frankly, what our rules say, but a cap would basically asset growth cap for a troubled institution would solve that issue, and it would be a much easier tool for us versus us having to analyze multitude of factors to ascertain if a new and novel product is a broker deposit or not. So would that's... It, it would require legislation, yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Rand. Senator Van Hollen of Maryland is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank all of you uh, for your testimony today. Uh, Mr. Sue, I have some questions for you about overdraft fees. 
because this has been become very big business uh, for banks. Uh, in fact, the numbers I've seen show that in 2020 alone, uh, banks generated $31 billion uh, from overdraft fees, tens of millions of American families. And a lot of these folks are living paycheck to paycheck. Um, one issue that I've been focused on for a long time is getting to real-time payments. Uh, I support the FedNow uh, system uh, because some people deposit their checks, but they take time to clear. Uh, and in the meantime, they get hit uh, with uh, overdraft fees. I think there, there was a time when people used their debit cards, and if there were not enough funds in their account, it would just say insufficient funds. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, as you know, the funds can be made available, and the consumer may have no idea that they've overdrawn on their account. Uh, so I have a question for you. I've been looking at some of the banks. Um, and under OCC's jurisdiction, seeing that there are three financial institutions that make 100% of their profit on overdraft fees. And my question is very simple. Is a, is a bank that makes 100% of its profits on overdraft fees a bank that is a safe and sound financial institution? So concentrations in which uh, revenues are derived in any form, whether overdrafts or others, is a, is a supervisory concern. So for, in those situations, we take a very close look at that. Uh, that factors into our safety and soundness assessments. I can't share those. Uh, uh, those are conf that's confidential right. supervisor information. Right. But that's certainly something we take a very close look at. But, but let me ask you this. I mean, this is a pretty extraordinary situation, right? Yeah. We're talking about 100%. And I, I want to credit uh, Eric Klein at Brookings yeah. Institution has done uh, work in this. Um, there are others that shockingly make about 50% of their profits on overdraft. Um, which is a huge number, but my question is if a financial institution is relying entirely on overdraft fees to stay a going concern, are they a safe and sound institution by definition? It, it certainly raises a lot of flags, and when the, we follow up on those flags to ensure that firms are safe and sound. Well, there are we've, three institutions we've seen. One is um, doing business as First Texas. The other is Academy Bank, and then there's Wood Forest, um, Wood Forest National Bank has 12 branches in the state of Maryland, um, including locations in Landover, Laurel, and Hanover. They're all, to my knowledge, located in Walmarts. And uh, these are people who are paying a huge amount of money, um, not knowing that they've exceeded their balance. Um, and it seems to me that if a financial institution is relying on overdraft fees for 100% of its profits, uh, that is a, a huge area of concern. In fact, it seems like definition, by definition that it's not safe and sound. What, what is in your toolbox now to prevent uh, this kind of problem? So, um, so I should state off front, I share your concern. I think excessive fees on overdrafts, um, predatory lending, uh, high cost uh, debt traps, these are all, all these things should be prohibited. They, they, not, they don't have a place in the federal banking system. Um, we have, we are looking very closely at overdrafts right now. We've got a review going on. Uh, these particular institutions have been identified uh, as well as other practices. We're going to use the full range of our toolkit within our supervisory toolkit to address it. Um, some of these have been uh, identified for some time and we've been working on it. So there, there's a time element uh, to d different cases. I can't speak to specific cases. Be happy to follow up with your staff to kind of walk through all the different things that we're going through and as, as we conclude this review. Okay, I appreciate that. As, as I said, we're talking about $31 billion um, a year, okay. um, mostly impacting uh, families who are going paycheck to paycheck. Okay. And it just seems to me that beyond these institutions, yes you and your fellow regulators should be really digging down on this because, as you know, there, there, there's some justification possibly for some small fee, but for the most part, this is profit for every bank uh, that is in, engaging in large charges for overdraft fees. And as you know, in many cases, I can go to my 7-Eleven, not knowing I've overdrawn, buy a cup of coffee, 35 buck overdraft fee, and then I can go down the road in the same visit, still not knowing I've tripped my credit and, and pay another overdraft fee. And I could do that 10 times a day without even knowing it. 
Can you look at ways that people can be protected from this? Yes, there's actually an interagency effort to, to address exactly, they call it like the $35 coffee. There's, there's an effort, uh, in, there's uh, 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 kind of draft work to address precisely that particular issue. More generally though, I think one positive thing that has happened over the past um, year and really picked up over the past several months is some of the larger banks have really started uh, reforming their overdraft programs and policies to make them less punitive, more flexible. Uh, there are some leaders in that space. Uh, we encourage that, and we're encouraging all of, the, all of the large banks to do exactly that, is to kind of rethink that so that it's both fair and it provides the flexibility that people need. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Bajano. And on Senator Menendez from New Jersey is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is incredibly important here. I want to thank you and the ranking member for holding it. Does our financial institutions work for everyone, for everyone? Uh, as regulators, you oversee those financial institutions, and it's vital that your organizations look like the communities, uh, the institutions you regulate ultimately serve. So uh, I, I appreciate some of the responses you've given, but I want to make clear that it's not enough to hire a diverse workforce, but you must ensure your leadership and senior staff are also diverse. Currently, only 8% of NCUA's senior staff, 3.9% FDIC's executive management, and 5.6% of the OCC's senior level positions, for example, are Latino. I think we can all agree that the largest, pop, uh, largest minority population in America growing exponentially, that doesn't work. Um, so can you all commit to significantly increasing Latino representation in your senior positions? I'll start, Senator, and absolutely. Uh, for me, inclusion is highly important. Having diverse views and perspectives need to be brought to the table. Um, and I, I, we recognize that our Hispanic uh, hiring is a weakness for the agency, that we are underperforming there, and we are going to be working on that to bring more people in. Right. Chair McWilliams? Absolutely, Senator. And I can tell you also that I have some numbers in front of me that we have an overall 2.6% increase in minority workforce uh, um, um, overall numbers since uh, I assumed my chairmanship compared to 2.4% over the eight years prior. And 34% of our 2020 examiners, uh, new hires were minorities, and our examiners represent about 50% of our workforce, and 31% of our overall workforce are minorities. The numbers speak. I was talking about senior. I, I understand, senior Senator. And and I, I, I appreciate those numbers. But the people in the, the corporate boardrooms and uh, senior executive management suites and the people in your senior executive management are critical players in developing policies and having sensitivities to communities. So I hope you can do better. Uh, Mr. Sue? So we recently uh, had a town hall where I talked about exactly this issue in terms of progress um, for Latinos and Hispanics within the OCC, senior leadership, tone at the top. These things I emphasize to the entire staff. We need to do better uh, at the OCC. Well, each of your agencies have an impact on capital formation and allocation, financial regulation, consumer protection issues, all of which impact, of course, every single community in the nation. But if we've learned anything from the financial crisis and now the pandemic, it's that it's economic turmoil disproportionately harms minority communities. And if your workforce, particularly at senior levels, does not have adequate such representation, the needs of those communities will continue to be overlooked and underserved. And that's why I, I raise this issue. Uh, I, uh, Controller Sue, I was very happy to read your proposal to rescind the Trump era Community Reinvestment Act rule, which in my view would have gutted an important civil rights law. And I hope your work on a revamped CRA is going to help address minority small business owners' lack of access to credit, a problem that played a major role uh, in how unequally the pandemic impacted minority communities. Now, as part of all of your uh, annual Office of Minority and Women Inclusion reports, each of your agencies report the results from diversity self-assessments submitted by the financial institutions you regulate. However, the submission rates for these voluntary reports seem extremely low. 19% for FDIC, 9.8% for OCC, and at NCUA, only 188 credit units, uh, U credit unions submitted such an assessment. Now, Chair McWilliams, as part of your diversity, equity, and inclusion strategic plan, you propose to streamline and enhance your diversity self-assessment to increase submissions 
what does streamline mean? Because I hope streamline here doesn't mean we're cutting down on useful information. Uh, I, I believe your agency should work towards increased participation rates in these diversity assessments. Um, and increased participation shouldn't come at the cost of critical information. Uh, Senator, actually, I'm glad you mentioned the number. The number is 19.5% response rate, rate, which is the highest response rate, frankly, because I pushed for it. And 2020 was the year when we achieved the highest response rate from our institutions. As you're probably aware, the statute uh, prevents us from mandating disclosures. So we are working. We have, um, I would say, the best um, with the rector uh, on the planet. Uh, and she has made this her priority, Nikita Pearson, who's, who's just a phenomenal addition to our team. Uh, and we're going to do whatever it takes to make sure that our expectations of banks are known and that we're working together in this area, both to increase our um, hiring of diverse candidates as well as to making sure that our institutions focus on this effort, especially to mirror the communities that they serve. But streamlining doesn't mean, I hope, giving up critical information. The reason we ask for this information is to be able to make the, the, have the science and the facts to make the case when, in fact, institutions are not being diverse. So I hope that when, I, you know, sometimes I hear reform and I get nervous because what we reform ends up being bad, bad, worse than what we reformed. And when I hear streamlining, I get a sense that maybe we're cutting out critical information. Well, I will put your uh, concerns to rest. Streamline, in this case, meant creating an online portal that makes it easier for the institutions okay. to comply and working with small banks to know how to comply. Okay, and Ken, if I have one final question, Mr. Chairman, do all of you, uh, as leaders of your agency, have you set internal targets for the response rate of these voluntary self-assessment reports? We do not have an internal target. I am disappointed by the, by the response rate. We uh, would be supportive of mandatory reporting. Do you have an internal? We don't have it uh, because of the, of the statutory language, which prevents us from requiring this, uh, this self-assessment. But you could still have an internal response rate a goal uh, and try to make it clear to the institutions underneath you that it would be desirable for them to... We have done so. Uh-huh. So you have an internal response rate? We don't have, we have, well, we have a rate, response rate that's 19.5%. That's an, that's an actual rate. And every year we strive is, to get it, a better But is, is, that, is that what you have set as your goal, 19.5%? I don't know, Senator, that we can set a goal given that we can't require it. But you I can, can always you. set a goal even if something isn't required. That's not an excuse. Uh, controller, what, what can you tell me? I mean, I'm sorry, Mr. Sir. Absolutely. No, um, we do not have a, a goal set, although we do seek to achieve to improve it year after year. Um, I and each of the board members regularly speak about it. We'll be having a diversity, equity, uh, and inclusion summit where we will be emphasizing the need to well, uh, increase diversity. Equity. Diversity starts by a commitment at the top, by setting goals, and having entities and individuals that pursue those goals. So I look forward to working with all of you more intensely on this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Menendez. Senator Reed from Rhode Island is recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me thank the witnesses for their testimony, Mr. Sue, uh, along with Chairman Brown, Senator Merkley, and nine of my colleagues, I've once again reintroduced S-2508, the Veterans and Consumers Fair Credit Act. Our legislation would uh, very simply extend the existing military lending acts, 36% uh, annual percentage rate cap to all consumers. And it's my understanding that the nation's largest banks, most of which you regulate, do not charge anywhere near 36% interest. Uh, on any of their consumer credit products, and this would include J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup, and Wells Fargo. So, and uh, they are all supervised by OCC. So, does OCC view view charging a reasonable rate for consumer credit as indicative of strong and effective lending practices? Yes. No, that makes sense to me. Now, small dollar short-term loans that are typically not made by these institutions are extended at exorbitant triple-digit rate interest that trap borrowers in cycles of debt. I note that 18 states in the District of Columbia have strong interest rate caps that uh, stop predatory loans. Seven of those states are represented by members of this committee on both sides of the aisle. And these states have successfully experimented with the APR caps and consumers. And, and our belief is that all states should, have, all Americans should have these protections. Um, uh, 
does it, uh, the uh, OCC consider an abusive or deceptive practice for a bank to frequently make loans that borrowers cannot repay because it appears to us that the business model of many of these institutions is to get them in, uh, uh, make the interest so crippling that they can't get out and they're trapped. Uh, would you consider that uh, an abusive or deceptive practice? Uh, yes. So, you know, and I think that this is actually written into the interagency guidance on small dollar lending. Mm. First factor is that uh, borrowers can, make, can meet the initial uh, terms of the obligation. So I think these instances that you raise of being rolled over continually at high fees uh, are inconsistent with that guidance. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, Chairman Hopper, uh, we had a testimony from a credit union uh, official from Louisiana who testified that they have a, a, a loan uh, a, called a PALS loan, which is so, uh, designed to aid people who need short-term interest, uh, short-term uh, uh, credit. And uh, they do not uh, typically charge uh, uh, that lending. I think you have an interest rate cap, don't you, in the... In the in we do. Um, what is it, sir? The general interest rate cap is 18% for the PALS product, which you were speaking of. It is 28%. 28% overall, 18% for the PALS. And you are, your institutions are able to thrive and to multiply? <laughs> I will say that um, we've done some looking at the PALS product over time. Uh, credit unions have been using it, um, uh, but many more offer rates that are below the 18% cap for short-term dollar. Uh, and they've certainly been able to make it work. Thank you. Well, again, um, I think if we can move this legislation, we'll make an immense uh, progress in terms of helping uh, those who really do need help to get access credit at a reasonable rate. So I thank you all for your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Reid uh, and Senator Toomey. Thank you, and thanks to our witnesses for being here today and providing testimony for senators who wish to submit questions. For the record, those questions are due one week from today, Tuesday, August 10th. To the witnesses, you have 45 days, please, to respond to any questions. Uh, thank you again. With that, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you so much.